Okay, hi, I'm Benson, I work with Ellen, and I'm gonna talk to you about um, mainly just club feet. I could talk about the other pe feet too, but that'd be boring. So really quick, club feet, this is the fancy Latin name. Um, I'm just gonna go through, you know, chief complaint, history, exam, diagnosis, imaging, treatment, follow-up. This is a picture of Mia Hamm. She was like the captain of the uh, U.S. soccer team back in the 1990s, early 2000s. And, you know, U.S. soccer, women's soccer is making a big deal these days. So pretty much every girl watched, uh, watched Mia Hamm play. And the reason I have a picture of her is because she had a club foot too. And so the club foot's like no big deal usually, all right? This is uh, Christy Yamaguchi, she's an Olympic figure skater. She had club foot. That's Troy Aikman. I think if you Google people with club foot, these famous people show up. Um, and so mostly just idiopathic club foot, uh, sometimes just postural, self-limiting. Then you have these other reasons to have club foot, like syndromes or some neurologic thing, like uh, spina bifida. Okay? Uh, basically, it's one in a thousand. It's pretty common. And uh, mostly in these Polynesians, Hawaiians, boys more than girls, 50%. Half the time it's bilateral. And uh, there's, there's a bunch of reasons to have it. There's like a bunch of genetics behind it and multifactorial, intrauterine positioning, things like that. So basically, uh, I think the way it works is usually the baby comes out of uterus and then the OB-GYN passes the baby off to the pediatrician and then the pediatrician examines the baby and they go, oh, that's a club foot. And then the orthopedic surgeon will get a call and be like, I think this baby has a club foot. And then the orthopedic surgeon will be like, oh, okay, send it to my clinic next week whenever they get discharged from the hospital. That's usually how it works around Morristown, right? And then like in other parts of the world, you know, these babies might go just be born and then uh, like two months later or two years later, they'll like go to some doctor and they'll have club foot and it'll be like a neglected club foot by then, right? Because it's been two months. Um, so usually diagnosis at birth, it's a clinical diagnosis. It has no association to DDH, a, a real club foot. And uh, if, if it is a presenting a little bit later, the, the mom is just gonna be like, oh, there's a foot problem, my, feet, my child's feet turn in. Or, and then they might say something like, my, my family member had this too, okay? You can have intrauterine diagnosis. You can do an ultrasound. Usually around 12 weeks gestational age, you'll see it. That's an ultrasound of the club foot. Usually it needs to be on sequential observations because, you know, just the kid's positioning in the uterus, you can maybe think it's a club foot, but you're not sure. So usually if you see it more than once, it'll be a club foot, like three times. It doesn't really, I mean, I guess it doesn't really have much, like, prognostic value, but I guess some parents just want to know if their kids have a club foot before they're born. You know, uh, like I said, it's a diagnosis of exam, clinical exam. So you look for four things. You, you know, the baby's gonna come out of the uterus, you're a pediatrician, you're gonna look at it and you're gonna be like, oh, I see the kid's foot. It's got some cavus, which is, you know, this red line here. Oh, you see this red line? That's the cavus. The forefoot is starting to plant or flex on your hind foot. You have adductus, right? Right? The forefoot is turning on the midfoot. Then you have some varus, subtalar varus. That's a, the subtalar joins a hind foot thing, so you have to look at the back of the leg, but that's going to be some varus. And then you see equinus, which really just means that the toes are pointing down, like you're a ballerina or something. So you look for those four things, and you're like, oh, that has four of those four things, so it's club foot. And then there's things called posterior heel crease, and you have the midfoot crease, posterior heel crease. And then you have an empty heel, empty heel pad sign, right? You're, you're feeling for the, for the heel bone, but you don't feel it. Just like a, it's just soft there. You don't feel the heel because it's, it's turned in a different direction. So it's an empty heel pad sign. And you're gonna see all these creases, medial crease, posterior crease, those four things, and it's club foot. Sometimes it's just metatarsal ductus. You know, the orthopedic surgeon will get a phone call from a pediatrician, be like, I got club foot, and then they see it. It's not club foot. It doesn't happen a lot, but. It's okay, better safe than sorry. Yeah, you'll see an empty heel pad sign, midfoot crease. You'll palpate, you can palpate the tail of the head on the lateral side of the foot. And also you're gonna notice that the calf is usually smaller and the foot's smaller on the affected side. And you could have a very small leg length discrepancy. So I put these in red because it's important to know that club foot is actually a, a whole leg thing. It's not a foot, it's not just a foot problem. It's a whole leg, the whole leg's affected. So classifications, they really aren't important unless you're doing research. They, it's just to help with outcomes, but 
This is the Demeglio classification. It just helped with research. It's really unimportant. Um, and then your imaging, there's really no imaging required to diagnose club foot, okay? You don't have to get any x-rays. You don't have to do anything about the feet. Sometimes you can get an x-ray at four months just to make sure that the deformity is going away or to look for residual deformity. Um, and they might have some prognostic value. Some literature out there says that x-ray has prognostic value, but essentially you don't need an x-ray for club feet. And then there's untreated club foot. This is the natural course of what happens in these other countries that don't really have you know, good medical care. Uh, it's very rigid. They have a dorsal lateral callus, the hyperflex midfoot. And uh, you know, surprisingly, what they found is these people are very functional. Um, they just walk around on the soil and they just walk around like that. It's like having a sime amputation, like where you amputate your foot in the middle of the foot and then you just walk around on it. That's essentially how functional they are. And usually the only the people who live in the city are painful because they're walking on hard sidewalk. But if you're some guy living in you know, a country that doesn't have sidewalks and you're just walking in the dirt, they walk on like that just fine. And so, uh, and so this is a story. I joined some running cult last year because uh, I wanted to get back in shape. And uh, one of these people has some like, residual club foot deformity. And so we ran this like 10 kilometer race. It was like a Chinatown race. And like, you can't tell, but one of these people has a club foot. If you really look closely, you'll know who it, who it is. But um, he beat me by like 30 minutes. He had like a residual club foot deformity. He beat me by like 30 minutes on this 10 kilometer race. So I mean, these people are really functional, okay? No big deal. Um, this is the treatment algorithm. This is what you want to tell parents when you, when you tell their baby, oh, your baby's got club feet. Now, now the mom's all like concerned, like, oh my God, they have club foot. Then you're like, don't worry, Mia Hamm had a club foot. She's like an international soccer star. Christy Yamaguchi had a club foot. She's Olympic, you know, Troy Aikman had a club foot. He's NFL quarterback, Hall of Fame. And so what are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell them? You're basically, like, you're going you're to say, oh, you're going to need a cast. You have to come back every single week for a cast for like five to eight weeks. And then it's basically, you have, to, you have to tell the mom they have to come back weekly. And you can either begin at birth or just whenever it's stable. You don't have to start right away. Um, from my point of view, it's easier just because the kids are still smaller. They're not kicking you all the time. But then if you start at like, if you start casting at like two months old, then they're really strong and they're kicking. And then you're trying to like put the cast on, but then they're like strong now. So it's harder to put on. And then 90% of them these days are getting Achilles tenotomy at six to 12 weeks old. And then the most important thing, though, you got to tell them they're going to be in these braces for, until they're four years old, mm -hmm. which is, it's actually a really arbitrary number. The guy Ponzetti casting, he just, like, decided to make four years the, uh, the cutoff. But I think it's because from zero to five is the most rapid period of growth in kids. And so your highest chance of recurrence is going to be when you're rapidly growing, right? And so you have to wear these braces until you're four years old, unfortunately. But those are the kind of things you want to tell the, tell the mom when you tell them their kid's got club foot. They have to see the doctor every week for at least two months, and then they might get a little, small little surgery, and then they're gonna be in these braces until they're four years old. And then one time I had this, um, like a 13-day-old patient, but it was like a 13-year-old mom. So it was a 13-day-old patient, 13-year-old mom, and I had to tell her, you're gonna come see me like every week. And then she was like, oh my goodness, right? And so this is kind of like what it looks like. You're trying to like fix a club foot casting. Eventually it comes out again. And that's the, the, that's the tenotomy. Some people do it in the office, some people do it in the OR because you're 100% sure you did the full, cut the whole thing. It's percutaneous, you just stick the knife in there and just cut. And then they get stuck in these. These are uh, Mitchell shoes, Mitchell shoes and brown bar. They're, they're stuck in these until they're four years old. And t there might be like some, there might be a, uh, a research uh, project out there trying to like figure out which club feet you can like not do till you're four years old, but until that comes out, the, the kids are in there until they're four years old, okay? And so take them points, club foot affects your entire leg, right? Basically, Ponzetti casting, casting is just, casting just is the gold standard treatment right now. It was accepted in the 1990s. Back in the 1970s, they were telling you you have to do surgery, you can't do casting, but now it's 2019. We've been doing casting since 1990, okay? I would tell the parents they need weekly visits, and then they're gonna wear a brace until they're four years old. And then about 30% of these kids get this dynamic supination. That's when they walk, their like big toe kind of like, their entire foot kind of supinates. 
while they walk. So dynamic supination. So 30% people might need surgery when they're like four years old because the club foot kind of comes back. Surgical treatment, this is surgery. This is why we cast because, I mean, this, this is cool to do, but I don't think any mom wants their kid to have surgery like this. And you only have to do it if, the, if it fails or if you have uh, sometimes syndromic neuropathic feet or it's a delayed presentation. And then it's really just a la carte. It's like dim sum. You just pick which tendons are tight and then you just cut it. All right? Sometimes you put a pin in it, sometimes you don't. And then you have these sequelae. These things happen with the club foot, midfoot adduction, supination, dorsal bunion, navicular dislocation, valgus hind. These things can happen. You don't want it to, but sometimes when the club foot comes back, you get this midfoot adduction. You get that dorsal bunion, forefoot supination I was talking about. If you, uh, if you, if you're really aggressive with your casting, you can mess up. This happens, and then you turn your club foot into like a vertical talus almost. <laughs> Try not to have this happen. And sometimes they get this valgus hind foot if you like overcorrect the subtalar joint while you're doing club feet. And then sometimes they continue the internal rotation. But they'll grow out of that. And then these are, you have an idiopathic club foot, but these are a bunch of syndromic club feet where uh, they're a bunch of syndromes where you'll see club feet. So that's pretty much club foot. This is just an example. This kid has spina bifida, very cute spina bifida feet. They had club foot casting. Then it came back because they did a percutaneous tenotomy. Uh, then you just recast them. And for recurrence after club feet, it's just more casting. Cast again. And you can see it's a lot better. The left is what he was after casting. The right is his recurrence. And then you just, you have to do surgery. For spina bifida, that's different. You have to take a whole chunk of Achilles tendon out, like a whole centimeter, and not just uh, anything else. That's, that's pretty much it. This is some kid in your muscular feet. Uh, you can see the toes are white. When you're casting, you don't want those toes to be white. You see how the toes are like white? If you put a cast on, you notice the toes are white, take the cast off. It means like you overcorrected and there, there's no blood going to the foot. You don't want that to happen. Okay. And that's it. And there's a bunch of congenital foot deformities, but, you know, for time's sake, we'll just not do that. All right. And that's club foot.